Hello, welcome. I hope all of our mics are on. And by the way, I've been given the advice that we should stay very close to the mic, that it works best. So let us know if there are any sound problems, but it should be clear. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this evening's program featuring the author, Elizabeth Strauss. My name is Julie Dust, and I am the chair of the National Arts Club Literary Committee. And for those who are not familiar with is a 501c3, um, a nonprofit with the mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts, uh, annually offering more than 150 free programs, including exhibitions, concerts, lectures, and readings. For more information about the club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. On behalf of the President, David Doty, the Board of Governors, and the Literary Committee, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Elizabeth Strout is the author of nine novels, including Olive Kittredge, which won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize and was made into an award-winning HBO series. My Name is Lucy Barton, which was adapted as a Broadway play, O. William, and her newest novel, Lucy by the Sea, in which we revisit both Lucy and William and find them precipitously leaving New York City, scrambling to respond, as we all did in the spring of 2020, to the early days of the COVID pandemic. Strout's writing has been praised for its wisdom and compassion, and about her very first novel, Amy and Isabel, a Times reviewer wrote, it is one of those rare invigorating books that take an apparently unfamiliar world and peer into it with ruthless intimacy, revealing a strange and startling place. And those words could hold true, I think, for all the books since, and especially Lucy by the Sea. We're so lucky that Elizabeth Strout was able to be here tonight, and she will be in conversation with Jessica London, who is a member of the National Arts Club and the Literary Committee, and Executive Director of the Council for Canadian American Relations, and in partnership with the club, runs the program Cross Border Currents. After their conversation, we'll have time for some questions, and then Lucy by the Sea will be for sale over there, and the author will be signing copies. So without further ado, please give a warm round of applause to Elizabeth Strout and Jessica Lundin. Well, thank you, Julie, for that introduction. And I'm truly delighted to be um, in conversation tonight with Elizabeth Strout. Thank you. Um, Liz, for those who thank followed you. Okay. <laughs> thank everybody for being here. For those of you, um, for those who've followed your work over the years, mm -hmm. the world in Lucy by the Sea is a familiar one, where characters appear whose histories we know, like Olive Kittredge. However, if you're picking this up as your first Elizabeth Strout novel, Lucy by the Sea can be appreciated entirely on its own. Is that something that you're concerned about when you're writing? How much of the backstories need to be filled in with a new book? Well, I always write a book hoping not hoping, but understanding that it may be the first book of mine that somebody picked up, and so please may it deliver as a full book. Um, and I don't want people to think that they have to read anything before that. But my head keeps percolating with these people that I've read, I mean, that I've written. I think that's so, <laughs> read and written a million times. Um, so they do show up again, but I need, but I'm conscious of trying to make the book be just a book for any reader to pick up. And I think it does completely work that way. Um, the novel begins with Lucy's first husband, now ex, William. William was a scientist and saw it, he saw it coming, Lucy says on the first page. He picks her up from her apartment in New York and they drive out to the coast of Maine. Lucy expects she'll soon be back, but they end up spending the first year of the pandemic there. I read that during your drives at the time to parts of Maine where you grew up, you came across a house on Bailey Island that brought Lucy back to mind. Can you talk about the process of how 
as you said, characters come to you as you find them swimming around in the water? Well, I had honestly just finished O. William. Um, I think I had just barely turned it in when all of that happened and March happened. And, and to tell you the truth, I was even thinking, because we didn't, I didn't know how long the pandemic was going to last. And I thought, I actually thought about making an epilogue to O. William. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, no, because I liked the way O. William ended and I didn't want the reader to turn a page and find a different sort of thing going on. But that's how close my mind was with William and Lucy at that time. And so when this all began to happen, I realized, oh, let's go. <laughs> so I brought them back up to Maine, but a different part of Maine than they had been in O. William. This was on the coast. Mm -hmm. And there was a house, there is a house that I use. I always use, or very often use visuals, you know, um, that I see in order to ground me and the reader. Okay. Um, you've said that Lucy kept surprising you. Did you plan or were you aware of where the story was going when you started? Uh, or did it evolve as you experienced the pandemic day to day? Right, no, I had no idea where it was going, but I don't usually. Um, in any of my books know where they're going. And I've finally come to understand, for me, that's a good thing. Because if I'm not surprised, then you won't be surprised. Um, so I've come to accept that <laughs> and just figure, OK, we'll just see you know, what happens. So, so that's generally how I write anyway. But, um, particularly, but I don't think I've ever written something so close to the time period that it was happening in. And, and that was. It was just strange, you know, because I, I mean, I always write in scenes. I don't usually write anything from beginning to end, but these scenes that I would put down, I thought, what, what will I do with all these scenes? And then eventually Lucy by the Sea emerged as a book, but, but it was an odd way to write it, hmm. just because it was so close to what was actually happening. And different from the others. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have a little m more freedom with my other books. I can. They're, you know, they're still happening in real time mostly, but they are fictional real time. And this was fictional, but it was also, I had to pay attention to what was going on in the world because this was a real thing. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that later. William's motivation is to rescue Lucy, and yet through the novel, Lucy um, ends up supporting William through his journey of family incidents, his relationship with his estranged sister that he comes to know, his daughter, um, that, that he has from a second marriage. Over time, Lucy comes to understand William with more compassion, a deepened sense of connection, and a more mature and evolved love, I would say. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can read a segment that we talked about on 153, I think, just to sure. um, reflect that a little bit. After having just told you that you don't need to read anything previous, I will tell you <laughs> that in O. Oh, well <laughs> that in O. William, um, they went up to Maine to find his, his sister, <coughs> his half-sister. And so he has now finally contacted her again, and they have agreed to meet on the University of Maine campus. Um, so it's just going to be a page and a half, so don't worry. <laughs> you know, I, know it's, I know what it's like to sit there and wonder, oh, um, <laughs> All right, so he's spent the day. It was 7 o'clock by the time William pulled into the driveway. He came almost bounding into the house. He had taken his mask off on the way to the house, and he said, Lucy, she's wonderful. Lucy, she loves me. This is what he said, with his big brown eyes positively shining, and oh, dear God, I was so glad. I said I would cook that night so that he could tell me everything. And so he sat at the table and spoke more rapidly than I could ever remember him speaking. I have a sister. He kept saying this and shaking his head. Lucy, I have a sister. He told me they had met on the steps of that they recognized each other immediately, not only because we were the only two old people on the steps, but because they recognized each other, even with their masks on. The minute I saw her, I thought, it's you. And he told me that she had said the exact same thing. And so they took their lawn chairs and sat on the large area of grass in front of the library, and they talked and talked and talked. Lois said that she had gone to the university, that all her kids had gone there, and that her eldest grandson had graduated from there two years ago, June. She said that she'd met her husband there, and that he'd gone to Tufts for dental school. She said that her youngest brother, Dave, ran the Trask farm, the potato farm that she had grown up on with his son, Joe. 
And then she asked about William's daughters. She was especially kind about poor Bridget being stuck with her mother's loser boyfriend. She had been so nice about that. And when William told her about Chrissy's miscarriage, she said to me, Lucy, she got tears in her eyes. She had said she had miscarried twice, and she felt just awful for Chrissy. And then they talked about their mother, Catherine Cole. Over and over, they went on about what Catherine had come from and why she had married Lois's father and why, had she, had, and why she had left him for the German, as Lois referred to William's father. I sat watching William from across the table. In all the years I had known the man, I did not think I had ever seen him so happy. Only later that night, as I lay awake, did I realize that William had been lonely. In spite of me and our girls and Bridget and his two other wives, William had felt alone in the world, and now he had a sister. Inside myself, I wept from happiness and sadness both. And then right before I fell asleep, a thought went through my mind that William had chosen to come to Maine during the pandemic because he had a sister here. He must have been hoping this would happen, a resolution between them. Otherwise, he would have taken me to a house in Montauk. But we had come to Maine. Could that be true? I wondered this as I fell asleep. William likes to fix things, and this could not be fixed, Lucy notes at the beginning. It seems to me that William grows as a character throughout the novel. He read part of it. Could you talk more about that? Right, well, in, okay, I'm, st I'm doing exactly what I said I wouldn't do, but in, in My Name is Lucy Barton, which is the first of the Lucy books, she sidesteps her marriage altogether. She literally tells the reader, I'm not gonna talk about that. And so we only know that William's father was a POW from Germany during World War II who had come to Maine. That's all we really know. And then in O. William, we find out a little more about him, you know, and his problems with distance and everything like that. But in this book, I think that we finally get to see him more. Well, he gets to see himself more. It's not just that we get to see him. He is emerging as we all do. And I think that, um, I think that there's a myth in this world or this society that people reach a certain age and they stop. You know, they just stop and hang out until they die. And that's just, that's just not true. You know, I don't think that's true. I think that people keep emerging and keep growing and the circumstances that they live through make them evolve or either make them evolve or make them shrivel up and get bitter. And William is actually kind of relaxing into himself in a bizarre way during this time. So. You've spoken, I think you've said people can grow bigger or smaller. Get bigger or get bitter. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um, you've spoken about two major literary influences in your life, William Trevor and Alice Munro, right. and described them as having great authority and as, quote, the bookends of your career. Um, can you talk a little bit about each, what you admire about them, and how each has helped shape you as a writer? Well, I think they're very different in a way. Um, William Trevor's short stories, I mean, he's written many novels as well, but I, I like his short stories in particular, and I have two copies, one upstairs and one downstairs, <laughs> so I don't have to go up and down to get them. Oh, that's terrible, but anyway, that's the truth. So, um, and his short stories are very gentle. There's a gentleness to him that is really quite comforting, and yet he, he goes straight for the sad things in life, but he does it with a gentleness, and the few details that he uses are so specifically chosen and brilliant, I think. So that's a different kind of reading experience from Alice Munro, who comes to the page with great authority. Um, I would go wherever she took me just because she's like, okay, I'll go, I'll go there, Alice. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Because she just has this quiet but very firm authority on the page. And so from both of them, I've learned a tremendous amount. You've also talked about understanding how a sentence falls on the reader's ear, yeah. similar to music. Yeah. And your husband has said that writing and music are the two most important parts of your life, and that you hear the notes that the rest of us don't hear. Can you tell us how and what music has inspired and affected you? And I know you're a pianist. Well, you know, I grew up, I mean, I, I did play the piano. I mean, I had a great, wonderful piano teacher who had years years earlier been a concert pianist and he ended up at the University of New Hampshire married to a chemistry professor. 
and he was quite elderly when I was able to work with him. And he um, mostly worked with me with Mozart. And so, and the two note phrase, and he kept saying, can't you hear that, can't you hear that? And I couldn't hear it. And then all of a sudden one day I heard it and I realized, wow. So I really credit him with making me understand how every single word in a sentence is important because every single note he could hear if there was just one note that I forgot to play in a whole chord, he'd like say, where's that G? And so, you know, he was just wonderful. Um, and so I still play Mozart, mostly Mozart, and, and other classical stuff. I used to play the piano in bars <laughs> back in the day and when I needed to make money. I mean, you know, what? A, what? Uh, I, no, I remember <laughs> that you went to law school because you didn't want to end up being a 50-year-old cocktail waitress. Right, <laughs> right. I had so many job jobs before I emerged as a writer, but I was always writing, mm -hmm. and nobody was interested in it. Not a soul. So, you know, I kept, I, I worked in every bar on the, you know, coast of Maine and New Hampshire and restaurants. I was in restaurants. Oh, that's, let me tell you, breakfast is the worst <laughs> because people need so many things and their tips are so terrible. But anyway, I just worked all the time in different jobs and temping and, and then I finally realized, well, I can play the piano. So I played it in a bar and the money was better but it was still tiresome, you know. And so I finally realized I just, I'm worried about being 50 years old and ending up as, a, you know, a cocktail waitress who's never published anything. So I went to law school, and when I was in law school, I realized, oh, well, that would have been perfectly honest living to be a 50-year-old unpublished writer <laughs> as a cocktail waitress. So that was helpful. And I'm sure saw great characters and gave you some ideas. Oh my goodness, yeah. every job I've had has been enormously helpful to me for all of that, yeah. Well, your observation of detail yeah. is uh, yeah. very so comforting. And do you still play? Yeah. A lo yeah. I, play, I play about an hour a day. So it balances? Right. Yeah. And I should play more than an hour a day, but, oh, but I play mostly an hour a day. Yeah. Um, I've always reacted, you're talking very emotionally, in identifying with the Lucy character. And my sense is that others do as well. I find myself always wondering how you do it, evoking such feeling through your stark, spare prose. Did spareness and directness come naturally to you? Well, you know, it's interesting because Amy and Isabel, the first book that I published, is, is obviously stylistically different from the Lucy books. Um, but all my books are different from the Lucy books in a way because it's first person. And that's a whole different thing to have to deal with. And so, you know, one of the things about writing first person is that I don't, I don't want the reader to feel like they're in the head of the narrator and sort of going crazy. You know, it's like I, 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 I you know, it's like, it, it can be very claustrophobic. And so, as I was writing the first Lucy book, because she came to me in the first person, and I realized she is her voice, then I, I was aware of being let's just have a thumbprint here and a thumbprint there. And that's Lucy because that's her voice. And so it's all one thing. You see what I mean? Those who know Lucy see her mature and deepen through this novel. Lucy's done the hard work of transformation, one reviewer wrote. Initially, she turns away from things that make her uncomfortable. And you touched on this earlier. Yet as she watches television and the coverage of George Floyd in January 6th, we see Lucy's sense of herself and the world change. Was that a conscious decision? It was a conscious decision because um, when she first finds out that a friend of hers in New York has died, her husband hands her the laptop and she just won't look at it. And then I was trying to figure out how to not make this book a political book. I mean, but how could I not? Because political things were happening so strongly. But I didn't want that to be the thrust of the book. And then I realized she looks away. And that was actually a helpful way for me to have it not, not have the reader's nose pressed into the political aspects because Lucy wouldn't look. And then Lucy realizes that about herself, that she looks away. Um, so I'm glad that she looked away when she found that first notice of of her friend who had died, because it was helpful, and I realized that would be Lucy. Lucy would look away, and yet it would all be bubbling down in her. And part of that growth and strength and right. being able to face as Lucy right. does. Yeah. Right. Um, 
Lucy's sister and brother return in this novel. We met them in My Name is Lucy Barton. And we see how each has come from the same background, but created their very own different lives. Um, her sister accuses her of the selfishness of escape that we know has saved Lucy. Um, is that something that draws you to a character or a story, someone who's trying to escape their fate or circumstances? I don't, I don't think in those terms. I don't think in terms of like an idea. I just always think in terms of the person that I'm writing about. I'm just very, very interested in people. And so the person that I'm writing about is what happens to that person. And then, you know, the fact that three siblings can grow up so differently is just really fascinating to me because you see it all the time. I see it all the time with my friends and even my own brother. You know, so that's that's interesting to me. But again, it's because it's Vicky and it's because it's Pete and because it's Lucy. Not because I was trying to make a statement about escaping, you know. And each such strong characters. Yeah. Well, I think about them all the time. Yeah. Still. They're in my head a oh. lot. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Um, I, I keep going back to that line in all of again, I think our job, maybe even our duty, is to bear the burden of the mystery right. which is much great with as much grace as we can. Right. Um, and that's something I think is mentioned in the book, some characters say it, but but I find myself in each of your books sort of right. back to that theme. Right. I think Lucy says that she I think she tells Bob that she read that. Yes. She yes. read that line in somebody's book. <laughs> It's my book, but anyway, um, because I like that line. I like that line, and I believe that line, that, uh, that our duty is to bear the burden of the mystery with as much grace as we can. So mm. I thought, well, let's have it in there again. <laughs> well, there's so many more things that, that I could ask you. I'm just I'm going to look at the time mm -hmm. and see where we are. Um, I think it might be a nice idea to open it up for some questions. I, I did have one last thing that I had started to ask you about, yes. and that was, I mean, it's wonderful to welcome you back to New York, but do you consider yourself still, I know you live in Maine, a New Yorker at heart of you? Um, yes, I, I, I love New York. I, I love New York more than any place on the earth. Big statement. I do. I lived here for 38 years, and the moment I saw it, I thought, wow, look at all the people. <laughs> I love it. So um, yes, I come from Maine. My ancestors came from Maine. My parents were so proud of the ancestry from Maine. I just didn't know why, but they were. <laughs> and I sort of thought that there was a mutation of genes that had taken place that, you know, like, why didn't I feel that? And now I'm back in Maine um, because of my husband, who I met in New York, but anyway, who came from Maine. Ugh, whatever, whatever. But I love New York uh, very uh, with all my heart. Love it. Well, we're so glad you're back. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up. So I'm deeply moved by you and your presence and your articulation and what you said about Trevor and Monroe. You, I would like to comment, have the gentlest and most graceful authority. Oh, you combine you. them in a, just an exquisite way. You, there's no pretension about you. You're so real and filled with knowledge and articulation. Well, that's lovely to hear. That's Thank what you. I want to say. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have such an intimate relationship with your characters, and I wonder if um, your characters have secrets and if you struggle with ever relaying those secrets or giving those secrets away in your writing. Um, and or like if the characters have lies 
about their lives that they believe. And when you feel like the struggle of betraying the characters when you have such an intimate relationship with them. Right. I, you know, I don't worry about betraying them because I love them. Actually, that's the truth. I mean, I don't care what they do. And I learned that with Olive Kittredge. Well, actually, I learned it with Amy and Isabel. I thought, just do what you need to do. But with Olive, you know, she was difficult. And I remember one night when I was done working, and I thought, oh, she's a lot to take. And then I remember specifically where I was standing, and I thought, let her be Olive. And that was very freeing for me, because I realized I'm just here to report on her. I happen to love her. I don't expect everybody else to, but I love her. So I was writing with a full heart. And one of the things that, one of the best parts of writing for me is, is to be able to go to the page without judgment. Because in real life, we, we are judgmental. And I think we probably have to be, to some degree, to make our way through life. But when I go to the page, I, I have no judgment, even on the worst people that I write about. I'm just there to tell about them. So I don't worry about betraying them. Um, and if they have a secret, then you'll probably find out. <laughs> because I'll find out. <laughs> you know? Was there anything in particular that surprised you when you were first published and also uh, when Olive Kittredge became such a, like what was the most surprising element of, of finally getting published and then getting that sort of big success? Well, um, the truth is I was terrified. I had been working in isolation for so many years and then I wrote Amy and Isabel and you know, I didn't know anything about publishing not one thing did I know, but I sort of, in retrospect, realized that there was a little tiny rumble going on that this book might do well. And then when it did, um, and back then they really sent you on tours, you know, like I had a 27 tour, 27 city tour. And honestly, I was just very frightened because I was in front of people. And back then you had to go on the local ra t TV station and, you know, everything, and it was, I was exhausted and I was frightened, that's the truth. And then when I won the prize, thank goodness I was older when I won the prize because you know, I wasn't as rocked by it. But I do remember thinking, oh, well now I might have more readers. But then immediately I realized, ever since I, ever since I was writing, which was years and years, I've always held myself to the highest standard that I could possibly hold myself to. And then I realized, well, I'm still gonna do that. So, no problem, <laughs> except for. <laughs> Except for the problem, <laughs> you know. But that's the that's the truth. Is that was I was terrified with Amy and Isabel. Yeah. Feisty in the yeah. in the uh, senior home that she's in. Any chance of a, another Olive book in the future? You know. Um, I can only say that, and I don't, I can't ever talk about what I'm working on because, honestly, because it's not good for it. I would, I would love to sit here for an hour and tell you what I'm writing, but I'm not going <laughs> to do that because it's not good for the book and it's boring to you. We'll come back. But, <laughs> but I will just say that Olive has a certain role, and it's not an Olive book, but she's present. Great. Yes, we will invite you back. <laughs> Handed person, yeah. sleeve. You said earlier um, that you write scenes separately. Yeah. Can you elaborate a on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I learned to do that back when I was raising my daughter, and you know, and and also teaching at Manhattan Community College, which was a wonderful job, frankly. But I would have like maybe two hours every other day to do my work, and. I began to understand, like, okay, just stop worrying about getting Isabel Goodrow out of the A&P. <laughs> just leave her there. <laughs> and that was the best thing that I learned. And then I realized that if I could write a scene during those two hours that had what I ended up calling a heartbeat to it, 
And I figured out that if I used something that was happening in my own life, like it could have been anything, like just dreading going to the dentist or something much bigger, but there's always, I think at any given time, there's always a little hook in our chest that's like nagging us for some reason a little bit more than anything else. And if I could use that sense of urgency in my own life and completely transpose it, I mean, factually make it completely different, but the feeling could get transposed into the character at that moment, then I realized, oh, this scene has a heartbeat. And so that's when I began to write in scenes. And then eventually you realize that they connect. <laughs> Sounds like it's just like that. It's not just like that at all. It's a <laughs> tremendous moment of um, anxiety. But, but they do. If they're, if they're real, they actually will ultimately connect and, and a book will come. No, as a matter of fact, right, the last page of Olive Kittredge I wrote way before I had even written that story. It was just the last page I had this image of her lying there with this fellow, and I wrote it down, and I actually wrote end question mark on the corner, and I'm a very messy worker. I have lots and lots of papers all over the place, but, and then as I was like writing that story, and I realized this might be the final story, and then I thought, oh, I have the end. And I found it. I found it. And it's almost word for word. And I rewrite tremendously. But that last page was right there waiting, which is interesting. I mean, I think it's interesting. Maybe not just that. <laughs> yes. You talk about um, both Lucy and William's different and complicated relationships with their daughters. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lucy's, she just loves them so much that um, she's having trouble watching them grow up and become adults that don't need her in the way that they used to. So that's Lucy's story mostly through Lucy by the Sea is, is beginning to realize that they're, they're grown up and she has to step back. Um, although at the end, she comes in full force as a, as a mother, but to grown children. Um, and William is just sort of William and he's, you know, but, but during the course of Lucy by the Sea, from Lucy's point of view, which is the only one we have, she realizes that William has been a more active father than she thought because she hasn't been married to him for 20 years, and she thought back in the day he probably wasn't that active, but he does. He takes charge in a way that she almost can't. So we see that evolving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of places in the book where you talk about Lucy having people come in her dreams Yes. who have died, right. and they go back to the place where dead people go. Right. Um, can you talk about, has that happened to you, or where that came from? Well, you know, that came from Lucy, um, because I'm just concentrating totally on Lucy, 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 and, you know, her sort of visions, which are she's had in previous books and whatever. Um, but, but it was very interesting to me, because it seemed to me that they would come to somebody like Lucy in her, in her dream. Um, but then the fact that her second husband doesn't, I found that that was just interesting to me, that he just wouldn't show up, except one time to try and pull her down with him. So it was just organically part of, of the story. And it felt real to me. I actually had a little question. <laughs> I'm trying to yeah. think how to formulate it, yeah. unless I cut somebody else off. No, no. Um, my sense of Maine in your books has somehow been more, I've assumed in a way it came more from your past than your more recent life moving up there in marriage and so on. Is I was curious if your sense of the state, almost politically, given what we've all witnessed the last few years, has, do you have any insights into the Maine of your youth versus what you see now just among the regular people, or? No. 
<laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I was hoping you could bring the wisdom to us. No. <laughs> um, I mean, when I was young, I, w I was not a political person. I mean, my parents weren't involved with political situations at all, and so I sort of grew up in a vacuum in that way. Um, and now I'm married to a man who used to be the Attorney General of Maine, so he's very actively <laughs> involved in all of this. Um, but I, I guess, you know, I mean, I should have just let it go with no, but I, <laughs> but I didn't. So, so I guess my, my current image of the people of Maine hasn't changed that much from my childhood image of the people of Maine. I wasn't there for 40 years, so. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions, and then maybe we should go to. Well, oh, we have a few more. One second. Have you ever used or revisited things you wrote prior to having Amy and Isabel published? Um, yes. Um, but not much, because they're not interesting to me anymore. Uh, but they, they were, some of them were published in small literary magazines and things like that, and just going through my studio just to try and clean it out, you know, like I came across some of them and I thought, oh, I'm not, I'm not interested in that anymore. And it sort of broke my heart because I can remember working so hard, you know, on these particular stories, and now I'm like, ugh. But that's sort of the way it goes, I think. You know, I was cutting my teeth. Is that an expression? <laughs> Phew. <laughs> I just finished Lucy by the Sea this afternoon, and it was wonderful, so thank you. Um, did you have a role in the casting of Olive or uh, Lucy and the uh, audiobook uh, reader? Because I listened to it. The audiobook reader, um, I think she's wonderful. I don't listen to them because it's hard, because it's not my voice, but I think she does a wonderful job, and I have been a fan of hers from the word go. Um, I did not have anything to do with the production of Olive Kittredge. Apparently, I told, which sounds like me, apparently I told the, um, the writer at the beginning, and maybe the director as well, just do what you need to do. And I only remember that because she thanked me for that years later. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, there we go. So I didn't really have anything to do with that production. Now, with Laura Linney, Laura Linney and I, I I think I had been asked by somebody, um, a journalist or something, who I could see playing, you know, Lucy, and I and I said Laura Linney, and then bizarrely, our agents had us meet for lunch, and neither one of us knew why we were there. <laughs> and she's a lovely person, so we had a wonderful time, but then we just didn't quite know why we were there. <laughs> well, then the agents did know why we were there, but anyway, and so. So she was already sort of like, you know, I, but, but then that was a different thing because there was, a, there was a person who wrote it, but she took all my words. So every word that came out of Lucy, Bar at Laura Linney's mouth on stage was something that I had written directly from the book. She just, the Al I mean, what's her name? Rona Monroe, um, adapted it. But it was all my words. And so that was a little bit of a different experience. And I went to rehearsals you know, which was interesting, fascinating. Oh, she's so, she's just so wonderful. I, I think she's amazing, so. One last question, I think. Uh, uh, maybe this gentleman here? Or two more there, two more there. That's the man has glasses. You speak of your characters as if they're real people. Yeah. 
And so I was wondering if there have been people in your life that believe the characters are patterned after them. Well, if they do, they don't tell me. Um, because mostly I write about Maine, and nobody's in Maine's going to say a word about anything <laughs> to me. So that's helpful. Um, and but they are very real to me, and but they're not they're not based on real people. It's interesting. I don't really know how they arrive, but they do. And if they, you know, like somebody like Pete Barton, I wasn't sure I could write a whole chapter about Pete Barton, but he just sort of kept nestling up to me, and I realized. <laughs> Okay, let's see, you know, you poor thing, you seem to have such a <laughs> non-life, but he doesn't have a non-life. It's his life. And so I don't know where they come from. I really, really don't. But here's one funny story. I'm sorry, I'll just tell you this really quickly. But um, um, in Olive Again, there's a character called Fergie who likes to wear, he used to like to wear his kilt around town. And so I was really into that story, and I... You know, my husband and I went off to the Topsom Fair where they have the Highland Games, and we watched everybody trot around with their kilts and this and that. And he also likes to dress up as a soldier, and they used to do that. I don't, they stopped that. But the point is that I was really into Fergie and his kilt and all that stuff. And my husband texted me one day and he said, Come home immediately. And I got home, and this man was walking down the street in a kilt. <laughs> and he lives in our town now. <laughs> And, and my husband said, okay, you know, that, you are now seriously spooking me out. <laughs> and I was like spooked out myself because I had not seen it. But there he was. And so I don't know where they come from. And, he, and this guy's not Fergie, but he looks like him. Yeah, so thank you for taking the question. I w was wondering if you talk about the motivation to keep writing. Yeah. Uh, because you finished one book and you talked about how you started writing immediately the other. We're talking now about right. this one and you're already writing the other. Is it the need to you know, develop more what the characters' lives are going? Is it just you're a writer and that's what you do? I am, I am a writer and I love to write. And even though there are so many days, many days, where it's very discouraging because I never have writer's block, I just write badly. And, and there are many days that I write badly, and I know that I'm writing badly, and it's frustrating, but I just keep writing. I've done this since I was four years old. I thought of myself as a writer since I was four years old, and I just, I feel like it's the only way I can get something from my mind to somebody else's mind that might be a living thing. And I always think about my reader, and I want to be giving these characters to my readers so that they could either see themselves in a little bit of a different light or look at their neighbor and realize, oh, that's not actually who I thought he was. Maybe he has these feelings when he wakes up in the middle of the night or something. You know, just to make it a little broader so that our vision can become just a little bit broader on Earth. Thank you. Thank you. And we are so much the fortunate beneficiaries, truly. Thank um, you. I think this is a testimony. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. That was just a fantastic conversation. I enjoyed it so much. And there are books and Elizabeth Stroud is signing in that corner.